I'm Sam Kemble. Welcome to Labour Market and Industrial Relations Review, a podcast by Workforce Delivery Inc. We conduct a management side educational commentary that focuses on industrial relations, employment supply demand, and employment administration. We review workforce management and labour market trends and focus on areas that we believe will be of interest to those in private sector settings in Western Canada. We are an apolitical organization and podcast. At times, we will weigh into politics and public policy issues, but only in relation to their impact on management union relations, employment opportunities, the sustainability of our capital investment climate, together with their impact on labour market dynamics in Western Canada. We hope that you enjoy our show, and if you do, please subscribe for future updates or visit us at workforcedelivery.com. Good day. My name's Sam Kimball with Workforce Delivery, Inc. Today I just want to start off by reminding everyone that our firm supports capital investment undertakings, whether it's construction, maintenance, shutdown, sustaining capital projects in Western Canada, in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and British Columbia. And the segment or the slice of the pie that we do is we, we do all things workforce uh, delivery. So we can we do workforce forecasting, we do supply strategies, we do onboarding, we do sourcing and we do costing in terms of uh, mapping out and simulating uh, payroll costs. Uh, if on, depending on different factors, we can run multiple simulations for your project to pull the numbers in terms of what it's gonna cost. And in doing so, sometimes we identify some tweaks or project specific tweaks that uh, it would be helpful to approach particular union on to either get enabling or uh, project labor agreements in place to support the work in a more responsible way, a sustainable and responsible way. And uh, so we've, we've done a, quite a few collective agreements. I would say it's uh, up more than 75 collective agreements, construction agreements, and that would include project specific project labor agreements. And so we've, we've got a little bit of experience in bargaining, uh, always on the employer side, that just seems to be where we fit. And uh, then after, once we get everything in place, we also take things to the field and, and we, uh, uh, are, we can walk, uh, help, help our clients through the project uh, by sourcing and managing labor relations on site. The reason that we're ins- I'm inspired to talk today though is uh, an article that Paul DeYoung uh, wrote in, on May 24th called What About Fairness for Taxpayers and Workers in BC? And the gist of the article is refl- a reflection uh, and really a commentary on two provinces. But starting off, it's a reflection of Manitoba, uh, kind of a then and now discussion where Manitoba used to be um, operate such that on public sector undertakings, contractors bidding on those work scopes needed to be affiliated with the building trades unions in order to conduct that work. There's not a whole lot of uh, non relatively speaking, there's not a whole lot of uh, non essential work that would be conducted um, in Manitoba that is not public sector. Much of the heavier industrial type of activity has been um, by Manitoba Hydro, uh, Kiask Mine comes to mind, and different dams. So at the end of the day, uh, that's kind of the environment. So much of the work that is more industrial, more akin to the type of work that unions would be more likely be, to be involved in is public sector. And to this point in Manitoba, it's, it's, that's been exclusively building trades by design, by legislation. And there's been a number of studies. There was a couple, there was one that came out on the kiosk mine on the contracting strategies and also the labor posture strategies that uh, led to delays and increased uh, costs on the execution of that work, major overruns. And uh, Paul actually points to a study that was conducted by the city of Montreal and the Cardiff think tank in this article, which suggests that uh, where there's non-open bidding, where it's all uh, focused on one labor posture and in a sense a closed site, that uh, labor costs typically range between 20 and 30% 
more than what would otherwise be achieved if there was more competitive open bidding processes. I, I will come back to that in a moment. But just to kind of get back to where Manitoba is now, Manitoba is just coming out of that restrictive regime and, and the current government has put in legislation that ensures fairness in the uh, bidding process and basically mandates that uh, all contractors and workers, regardless of union affiliation, will have access to either participate in, in, in doing so benefit from uh, the execution of public, public sector works. And I'll just kind of quote this, this legislation ensures that all qualified workers and their employers, regardless of their union status, have equal status to publicly funded construction projects in the province, and that all workers and employers in the province are treated fairly. So it sounds like a pretty good thing to me. And Paul's uh, I think article points to this being uh, paving of uh, opportunities for a more sustainable and open bidding process in the future for Manitoba. Now, the other reason for the article is that British Columbia is signaling, signaling that they may be going the opposite direction in British Columbia, and that that is by returning to the old days of requiring project, project labor agreements, uh, primarily specific, and specifically uh, with the building trade unions alone um, on public infrastructure projects in BC. And, uh, you know, it's funny that 20 to 30 percent range that was cited by the city of Montreal and Cardus, and it's cited in reference to experiences that have been um, happening in Manitoba, because, again, we've done some quite a bit of costing and forecasting and, and labor market simulations. And we've also construction managed uh, sites where there's two postures on the site, and we've done bargaining. Um, in multiple scenarios, both where there's uh, competition allowed, uh, i.e. bargaining for a project where there's a competing labor posture uh, in the mix versus bargaining for a project where it's already predetermined that it's going to be building trades. And that, uh, my experience aligns with the 20 to 30 percent in um, increased cost. So. There is a project in the north, for example, that um, initially set out as a, a six in one, more of a local schedule, six days on, one day off schedule. And there was provision for a, ro a rotation out every seven weeks or so. And so it wasn't very kind to travelers per se, but it was intended to be a local, you know, a good, a, a locally, local resource friendly uh, project cycle. And as the project went through the life cycle of, you know, kind of coming out of the civil side and into the mechanical and the harder trades, the project, uh, you know, quickly realized that um, it needed to cast the net wider, uh, that the local resources uh, were exhausted and they needed to cast the net wider and source workers from uh, further away from the project in regions, other Canadian regions. So in doing so, the project implemented a 20 and 8 schedule. Um, they noto indicated their, in their intent to uh, implement a 20 days on, 8 days off schedule, and, and the project was going to uh, pay for flights for individuals on that rotation uh, to locations within Canada. So increased costs for the project in a major way. It was, you know, by design, they needed to do it their decision. In addition, so 20 and 8, for example, they actually have to hire 25% more of a workforce to have the same number of workers boots on the ground because uh, at all times 25% of the workforce is off shift on an A, B, C, D shift with a 20 and 8 cycle. So there's increased cost because there are fixed more uh, unit variable costs by uh, per employee deployed on the project. And in addition to that, there's also increased costs in regards to the rotational and turnaround expense, whether it's a rotational allowance every uh, after every 20 days or round trip flights from across Canada. So a very expensive proposition. And in normal circumstances, when projects move to an extended work cycle to facilitate um, bringing in people to the site, they would approach this and, and uh, seek uh, terms and conditions where there's not quite as much of a hit on 
in the building trades world double time on Saturdays and Sundays on an extended work cycle. So the project did exactly that. They just went to this, uh, the, the building trades involved on this project and pleaded with them to say, look, we're putting in this, ex you know, extra measures to get the job done. We've exhausted the resources. Your members in the region that want to work on this project are working on the project, but we still need more people. We just need some relief on the double time from Saturdays and Sundays. And the building trades, um, you know, to their credit, they they said, and it was fairly dispassionate, but they, they said, we get it. We understand. We totally understand. We get it. We get it. We get it. We get it. We can't do it. And the reason that they can't do it is they didn't have to. They didn't have to agree to a fairly rational cost reduction, project-specific cost reduction, and it was a give and take. There was flights and stuff offered by the project, but the unions just simply said, we, we, we can't give that to you because we don't have to. There was, the, the work was already theirs, so why should we, why should we give you that? And it wasn't so much the union leadership, uh, their own personal opinion on the matter, is they couldn't go back to their members and say, look, we did this. When the member says, well, why, why did... The members don't want to know why, why did you do things, necessarily. The members want to say, why did you have to do it? That, that's kind of the conversation that I'm led to believe. And uh, in that situation, the unions that are around that table uh, said that uh, they didn't have a good answer for that question because the work was theirs. So, hence, that project spent um, about 27.6% more on labor costs than they otherwise would have had to if they were setting up a project agreement with some competition in the mix. So, the, the closed shop mentality does impact labor terms because it doesn't, it blocks, it doesn't have there's no catalyst to um, have the discussion and to um, compel the parties to face the market realities. And, and that was what was missing in that discussion. And, you know, people, there are no bad people in the mix. That was just the realities. The union leadership is elected. So if they give away something without having to, it's going to come around and be an election issue next time. So they have to manage that political process within their own organizations and without a reason to reduce costs for a client, it puts the union leadership in a very awkward position where they're unable to do that. So I totally get that, I accept it, whatever. What Horgan is proposing though is to actually prohibit uh, projects that are publicly funded from ha even having that having a catalyst to, to inspire that discussion and that's problematic from a tax I think a responsible taxpayers um, issue in addition that's like to kind of even step away from the public the public money responsible use of taxpayers funds discussion it also has the impact of just punishing uh, building trades favorite clients and my job for a certain part of many years when the posture is determined that it's going to be building trades I've I've been a, a salesman I guess a building trade salesman and it's really difficult though is if, if, a, if a union or a client or sorry if a client has promised work scope to a union and then that catalyst to require the union to get serious about what's happening in the labor market isn't there the impact is is that the building trades actually treat their most favored clients worse than than clients that compel them to compete so it's actually interesting because what would be their biggest allies are the ones that are paying premiums and i did see that in alberta quite a bit where you know, uh, favored clients, Syncrude and Suncor, paid premiums for years over and above what uh, CNRL and OptiNexon um, were paying. So, and it's not to pick favorites on owners, but just OptiNexon and CNRL picked an open managed site concept and uh, 
Suncor came later with that, but while they were holding on to more of a closed site, and Syncrude held on to a closed site, they were paying premiums. So it's kind of a paradox that the clients that building trades market themselves to were actually paying premiums over and above clients that uh, inspired the competition between building trades and CLAC and open managed, open open contractors. So just one other quick example. Uh, in Lower Mainland, um, BC, there was, uh, this wasn't even so much a, a, a huge departure. It was just a non-traditional building trades approach that allowed for us to have a certain flexibility in regards to crew composition, increased apprenticeship ratios and all that. And uh, that, that actually um, inspired or resulted in the potential for a 19.6% cost reduction. And unfortunately that wasn't taken advantage of because again of a very closed and uh, traditional building trade union approach or philosophy that was applied to that project. So back to the studies on the Montreal, City of Montreal and Cardis, 20% to 30% increase in costs when it's a closed site that's that's consistent with my experience, whereas 19.6% and 27.6%, just with those two examples. I've got tons of examples. I just can't share them all. Um, so I'm, I'm validating, at least with my personal experience, that claim that going down this path costs more money. It inspires less comp uh, competition, less responsiveness to the market, and, in fact, actually inspires... Uh, unsustainable uh, contract conditions and that's that's problematic for on a broader scale for two reasons on one hand unsustainable market conditions labor market terms and conditions um, there's metrics that are captured and shared globally and clients who can build can build projects in multiple areas look at say BC and go okay well what's their productivity factor productivity is a measurement of how much you have to pay to get what you know the this unit that of uh, work done and when you're sitting at 27.6 uh, percent over what would be rationally you know rationally applied to a project those numbers add up so BC internationally uh, gets a reputation for having a low product productivity factor and in short, uh, investment climate either leaves, investors either leave or they just don't enter the BC market. Uh, so there's lots lost opportunities for Canadians when uh, a project or a province sets up situations that inhibit healthy competition across labor postures. And in addition to that, um, there is always a reckoning. So at some point in time, people are going to realize that oh my gosh, we're up here, the market's down here, and we have to correct it. And that is just abundantly difficult. Um, sharp corrections on labor conditions just are difficult to do. They're, they they um, harm relationships, or they're impossible to do, and it just drags on forever and ever and ever. So it's not good for, not good, it's not good for anybody to um, the unions, the businesses and owners, investment climates and government. It's not good for anybody to set up a situation where labor conditions can outpace and just not be reconciled with market conditions. It's just not going to be good. The other reason, and this is a, another paradox if you will, is in BC, in particular north northeastern BC, um, much of the industrial work has not gone building trades over the last few years. And there was very little work, period, in the 20 years preceding that. So the situation is such that BC residents in northeastern BC particularly, and actually quite a bit in Vancouver due to fly in, fly out scenarios in Alberta, there's an abundance of BC resident clack and open shop workers, construction workers, uh, in that in the province of BC. So. The, the paradox of having though, um, and there's not a lot of excess building trade capacity in BC. Um, it's just a different market than 
Alberta. It's not, it hasn't been boom and bust, it's been slow, and now they're starting to get industrial work, but they, they just don't have that history. They don't have the legacy workforce that uh, we see in other provinces. So by limiting uh, work scopes to building trades only, for example, the paradox is, is less BC residents um, will actually be on those jobs than if it was more open because you'll hit thresholds in different craft disciplines quicker, more quickly with by confining the PLAs to build, like a building trade posture alone without accessing everyone that's available, whether the worker is union or non-union. So anyways, the impact is, is the socioeconomic impact of construction activity within the province of BC will be reduced by having closed project labor agreement scenarios. To conclude, it's ill-advisable for governments to put in place restrictions on in terms of what contractors can bid capital, capital projects, whether they be public or otherwise. It's just important to have that competition that nothing's going to regulate uh, labor, labor conditions more than just healthy competition. It, that, that in itself will do a better job than any regulation uh, can mimic, if you will. Um, and the reason is, is again, there's just no catalyst to have that healthy discussion between employers, unions, and owners and, and facing market realities if, unless there's scope that's at risk. Uh, union members need to have a reason to have faith in their leaders and their leaders have to have a reason when they go back to union members to say we needed to take double time out of Saturday and Sunday because if we didn't we wouldn't have got the work this other contractor would have got the work it's pretty much as simple as that there has to be a rationale or a reason um, why not why someone should it's why they had to move on a collective agreement term and conditions. And, and that's just a, a perfectly understandable response. So again, number one, there's no catalyst for that kind of healthy discussion. Uh, number two, there's just simply more bidders. And opening the market to more bidders uh, inspires creativity among contractors in terms of uh, engaging and continuously improving their execution strategies and um, that just that that inspires innovation which also reduces costs in the long run I didn't talk a lot about that before the conclusion but just simply having more bidders uh, and an open market and accessing all available bidders is healthy uh, and reduces costs and increases innovation and lastly uh, in BC in particular and that's what this article was about BC doesn't have the luxury of limiting their work scope to building trades. They don't have the they don't have the numbers. They don't have the workforce. So by limiting uh, uh, participation on a, on a public infrastructure project of any magnitude, the impact of that is there's actually going to be reduced socioeconomic um, benefits because the contractor and the employer employers will hit the thresholds in different craft categories earlier where they have to go outside of BC and bring in Alberta and Saskatchewan residents to shore up their uh, workforce. So in fact, and this is the paradox again, is by restricting uh, bidding provisions, it actually hurts more BC residents. And that would be an unintended consequence, I'm sure, of this uh, direction if uh, BC is considering it. Thank you for your time and uh, if you want to see more uh, videos like this on, among, along different categories, uh, please check us out on workforcedelivery.com. We have a video section there where we uh, post all our subject matter expert videos for your review. Good day.